Dr. Paul gives the youth of America a voice, whether it be his outspoken criticism of the drug war or his advocacy for a humble foreign policy. Dr. Paul has the courage to stand up to the establishment of both parties to, in order to fight for what is right. He is truly the candidate for peace and prosperity. Now, who's ready to hear from the next president of the United States? <laughs> prisons non-violent offenders in perpetuity. I stand against outdated drug laws that put kids behind bars, keep them from finding jobs, ruining lives, creating scars. I stand for privacy. I stand for a generation raised on technology. I stand against a government that invades personal privacy. Spying on innocent civilians. And definitely detaining American citizens in exchange for a false sense of security. I stand for peace. I stand for a less aggressive foreign policy. I stand against trillions of dollars pumped into wars that only create instability. I stand against thousands of lost lives. What have we got to show for our sacrifice? I stand for responsibility. I stand against too big to fail bank bailouts. I stand for a balanced budget and tax cuts. I stand against Federal Reserve handouts. And 18 trillion in debt handed down to my generation. I stand for a strong and prosperous nation. I stand for political authenticity. A leader who believes in the power of individual liberty. A true visionary. I stand against the status quo. Old men in suits constantly towing the party line. I stand with the anti-establishment candidate. I stand. I stand. I stand. I stand with Rand. I stand with Rand. I stand with Rand. I stand with Rand. I stand with students with Rand. I am a student for Rand. I am a student for Rand. I join students for Rand because this election is too important. I join students for Rand because the youth vote does matter. I join students for Rand because it's time to endorse liberty and elect for President Paul. Join students for Rand today at randpaul.com slash students. Republic. 
Use the Fourth Amendment. Get a warrant. Target the people who would attack us. You can find these people. If you look at who has been caught through the bulk collection of your phone records, not one person's been caught. Now, they tell you all the time, oh, we're catching people. We're catching people. We, we evaluated the 52 people they said they caught. They didn't catch any one of them based on bulk collection of your phone records. They caught them based on evidence, based on suspicion. If there's a murderer or a rapist in D.C. tonight, how do we catch them? With the Constitution. The police will stop on the doorstep. Every one of the policemen you see here, every policeman you see obeys the law. They primarily do. You have to obey the Fourth Amendment. So if they're on the stoop of a, of a house where they suspect someone to be a murderer or a rapist, they get on the phone and they call a judge. Why? Because it's called checks and balances. We want to separate police authority from the judicial authority so they would check and balance. Why? So we didn't have systemic bias. So you don't get a bigoted police officer decides to go into the house of black people or vice versa. You want to get out and get rid of systemic bias so you have checks and balances. As you know, you've seen it isn't always working. But the thing is, is that we do have rules. The intelligence director says, oh, well, we're not going to read your phone con or listen to your phone conversations or read your email. We're just going to collect them. But realize the people who are telling us this are the same people who lied to us. Do you remember James Clapper came before the Senate, and the Senate asked him, are you collecting the phone records of Americans? And he said no. He lied to us. He committed perjury in front of the Senate, and now he says, don't worry, we're not going to listen to your phone calls. Well, frankly, I've lost a bit of trust. The guy should no longer be office. He should be in prison for lying to the Senate. Yeah. Yeah. If we are to defend ourselves from those who wish to attack us, I think it's a reasonable thing to ask, why are you coming to America to have some rules about how we vet people? The Boston bombers came here. We gave them everything. We gave them housing. We gave them education. And they still attacked us. So we do have to be very careful about who visits us. doesn't mean nobody can come. We've accepted millions and millions of people from around the world. But for goodness sakes, before we give up all our liberty and all our rights, shouldn't we have some rules about who comes to visit us in our country? Absolutely. We need to protect ourselves. But I don't think we need to give up our liberty in the process. One of the things when I was in college, and it was a few years ago, <laughs> that I hated about politicians and sometimes adults in general was hypocrisy. I hated the fact that people were telling me to do stuff that they weren't willing to apply the same rules to themselves. In fact, Martin Luther King talked about unjust law in the letter from the Birmingham jail, and in that he said that an unjust law is a law that a majority passes on a minority but doesn't make binding on themselves. Think about that. It's a great definition for what is unjust. A majority passes a law on a minority, but doesn't make binding upon themselves. That is the real danger that we're wrapped up in at this point, and it is part of what I would call hypocrisy. Think about it this way. The last three presidents, let's say there's a good chance that when they were kids did something illegal with concerning drugs, all right? <laughs> but they went on to become president. But look at all the people in our society that aren't so lucky. Look at the people who are being arrested for drug crimes in our country. Three out of four are black or brown. But if you look at drug usage, you look at surveys of kids, and you say, which kids are using or smoking marijuana or have? It's 50-50. It's, it's, uh, White and black kids, same, same amount. There's no difference. So how did our prisons get to be three out of four kids black or brown in the prison? The war on drugs has been unfairly and disproportionately applied to certain people. And you say, well, is this because all police are racist and the government's racist? Probably not, because many of our police officers are black, many of our police chiefs are black. I don't think it's a racist thing, but it's a problem nonetheless. Why are we gathering up so many people of color and putting them in our jails for drugs? Because there is more of a grouping and more violence in our big cities, and they're patrolling all the time. So how do you fix it? You can't just tell the police, okay, be fair, because they're in the same community every night. We have to change the laws. I don't think we should be putting you or your friends in jail for marijuana. I think it's a dumb idea. <laughs> if you look at arrest records in the south side of um, 
Chicago, <laughs> predominantly African American, but then look at all of Chicago, which has a mixture of populations. 15 to 1, the arrest records are uh, 15 blacks for one white. Something's wrong with our war on drugs. We have got to fix this. This is a great problem. And for someone like myself who doesn't know what it's like really to live in poverty and didn't grow up in poverty, I try to understand why people are so unhappy. I traveled to Ferguson after that, and I talked with community leaders, and they were all African American. Many of them had their businesses burned, so they weren't real fond of rioting by anyone. But the one thing they said, and the one thing you can figure out from meeting people communities is, for every hundred black women in Ferguson, there's only 60 black men. We've incarcerated a whole generation of people. Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, they were part of the problem. They were the ones that introduced all of this war on drugs and made it worse. The war on drugs, getting on steroids, thank Bill and Hillary Clinton. They've been part of the problem. Sure, she's singing a different tune now, but she was part of the problem. And so when we look at this and we say, well, how are we going to fix this? You've got to get rid of hypocrisy. And so when I pointed out that I didn't like Jeb Bush still being for the marijuana laws and that he admitted when he was at school smoked marijuana, I don't care if he smoked marijuana. I don't care that he was rich. I'm all for being rich. I want to be rich. <laughs> but he's at an elite school, Andover, up in the Northeast, primarily with very wealthy people. He's saying, I smoked pot. No big deal. Well, yeah, the police don't come to your school. All right? So we need to understand that that it isn't okay unless he's going to consistently be for giving the same chance to other kids. If we're the party, I'm a Republican, if we're the party of family values and we want families to be together, we need to allow people to expunge their drug record if they're behaving. We need to take some of the felonies and make them misdemeanors so you don't have a permanent record. The biggest impediment to voting, to opportunity and a job in our country is a criminal record. And unless we figure that out, unless we figure out the war on drugs, we're going to continue to have this disparity. Everybody's talking about income inequality. Well, a large part of income inequality is not being able to get a job. And I think everybody does want a job. Can't get a job if you've got a criminal record. So we want to fix it. Let's fix the war on <coughs> drugs. And what I say is, let's don't put young people in jail for making a, a mistake. Let's give people a second chance. neighboring town lost both legs and an arm in the war and I'm proud of him and his service and if I ask him what he was fighting for he says he was fighting for the Constitution and for the Bill of Rights and when I think of my job up here being part of the decision of whether or not we go to war or not being part of the decision of whether or not we invade the Bill of Rights in our pursuit of trying to make the nation safe I think about him and his sacrifice. I think about him almost every day, what he sacrificed. And I think about, you know what? Wouldn't it be sad if our soldiers that were overseas fighting and us at home gave up on what they were fighting for? If we gave up on the Bill of Rights while they were gone? So much of what we are as a country is embodied in our belief in our individual liberty and the Bill of Rights from the First Amendment on. But we aren't doing a very good job sometimes of defending that. You know, the Fourth Amendment says the government can't come in your house and get your records. You do have a right to privacy. They were collecting 100% of your phone records. Now, they say they're not going to collect them anymore, but here's the way I imagine this new reform is going to work. There's a guy from the NSA, and he sits over at the phone company. He's still collecting all your phone records, but he's not going to push send to Utah. They're still going to have them. They're still going to be going through all your phone records. Do you know that 90% of your credit card bills are collected? 90 to 95% of your credit card bills are collected. If I have your credit card bill, I can tell whether you smoke, whether you drink, whether you gamble, and probably how much. I can tell whether or not you go to a doctor or what for sometimes, because I can figure out what kind of doctor you're seeing. If you charge your medicines online, I can tell your medicines. That's none of the government's damn business. The government doesn't need to be collecting our records. We need to be left alone. Justice Brandeis in 1928, in a dissenting opinion, said, the most cherished of rights from civilized men and women is the right to be left alone. You do have a right to be left alone. And people say, well, how will we defend ourselves? You can have both. I'm for collecting the records of, of terrorists. I want to collect more records of terrorists. All I'm asking is call the judge. Think about it this way. The Boston bombers, the Russians tipped us off to these boys. 
We didn't know that he flew back to Chetnia, which we should have done, because that's targeted surveillance, and that's doing an investigation, which I'm for. But I'm one of the biggest advocates of your privacy. But let's say I'm the judge, and they call me and they say, the Russians tipped us off to this boy. He's traveled to Chetnia. Will you give me, give me permission to look at this boy's records? I'm not just a yes, I'm a hell yes. So the thing is, is you can look at records. But uh, Malcolm Gladwell's an author, and he says, uh, I think he puts it pretty well, he says that knowledge does not equate with understanding. What does that mean? Let's say we're collecting everybody in this room's records. Do you think we might be overwhelmed if we had all of your records, all of your emails, all of your credit cards, all of your phone records? If we had all of that, could we be overwhelmed by the sheer volume of records? Think of 300 million people. If you're collecting every phone call in the country, could you be overwhelmed with information such that you really aren't able to do good research? So knowledge does not equate with understanding. And so we can have tons of information, maybe so much information, that it overwhelms our ability to investigate and go after the people who would attack us. The Bill of Rights is to protect the interests of the individual, but it's also to protect minority rights. And people say, how do I know anything about minority rights? You know what? You can be a minority because of the color of your skin or the shade of your ideology. You can be a minority because you're African American, Hispanic, woman, you know, you name it, a bunch of different categories. Gay, believes in God, doesn't believe in God. You can be a minority for a number of reasons. But the thing is, is that the Bill of Rights is supposed to be there to defend you. The Bill of Rights isn't so much about the high school quarterback or the prom queen. The Bill of Rights is about the least among us. The Bill of Rights is about defending everyone's liberty to not have an unjust and arbitrary government, to have equal protection before the law. But we're missing out on some of this. If you say, well, I'm, I'm afraid of terrorists and I just want them to collect all my records. Realize we did this during the Civil Rights era. We collected the records of all the leaders of the Civil Rights Movement. We collected the records of those who were dissenters, those who protested against the war. The ability to collect your records is such an enormous power that someone has to watch the watchers. That's the question. These watchers are everywhere. The intelligence agencies are incredibly powerful. Who's watching them? Who's watching the watchers? And when they come to us and say, you can trust us, we're not going to look at your phone conversations, your emails. Well, the problem is they've been lying to us about all these programs. You would have not even known any of this existed. If we want to believe in justice, we have to believe in the entire Bill of Rights. The Fifth Amendment says that the government can't take your property without due process, just compensation. Well, they're doing it. If you are riding down the street in D.C. and you make an unsafe lane change, or often some people have said it's driving while black, and it happens, people are upset, are stopped by the government, they say, do you have any money? And you say, well, yeah, I've got $1,000. I'm going to the dentist, and the government says, give it to me. This is called civil asset forfeiture happens in every city, in every state throughout the country, primarily to poor people. So you, you have $1,000, you know what the government will say? All right, if you sign this agreement now promising not to sue us to get your money back, we'll give you 500 of it right now. That's how white robbery. And it's also called civil asset forfeiture. I'm trying to fix this. I think that in a country like ours, you should be innocent, presumed innocent, until found guilty. That, to me, is one of the most fundamental things we supposedly believe in. And yet, we're not doing it. So I have a bill that would change that. It says you can't take your money unless you're actually found guilty of a crime. <laughs> the Sixth Amendment says you have a right to a trial by jury. And you say, well, certainly everyone is defending that. We, we certainly haven't been foolish enough to elect anybody to Congress who's actually arguing against your right to a trial by jury, your right to an attorney. Well, guess again. In the fear of our terrorism, they've actually passed a law, the president signed it into law, that says that an American citizen can be detained forever without a trial and without a lawyer. This goes against everything we believe in. And I think it makes suspect all of these other requests to give up liberty for security if we're going to give up the right to a trial by jury. During the debate over this, I'm having a debate with another Republican senator, and I'm incredulous. I'm saying, really? 
you're going to take an American citizen without a trial and you would send them to Guantanamo Bay without a trial? He said, yeah, they're dangerous. It's like, really kind of begs the question, doesn't it? Who gets to decide who's dangerous and who's not? And as the debate went on, I was thinking to myself of the times when we got it wrong. Does anybody remember World War II? We incarcerated 100,000 Japanese Americans because of the way they looked, because of their heritage, because of their race. We got it wrong. We got it wrong also in the civil rights movement, the civil rights era, by government getting so big and forgetting about the Bill of Rights and forgetting about protection. But I was also thinking of other times when we got it horribly wrong. There was a bombing in Atlanta called the Centennial Bombing in Olympic Square. This was a big deal and people died and it was a terrible tragedy. But the media immediately said, one guy did it, this guy named Richard Jewell. They said, Richard Jewell did it. His picture was all over television. Within hours, he was convicted on TV. Can you imagine being, everybody thinking of this terrible person who killed innocent men and women and children and civilians? Well, the only problem was it turned out it wasn't him. But when I'm thinking about this debate over whether or not you deserve a trial, whether or not you deserve a lawyer, I was thinking, you know what? What if Richard Jewell had been a black man in the South in 1920? What might have happened to him? That's the kind of thing that has to give you pause. So as much as I want to defend the country, as much as I want a strong defense, as much as I'm willing to look at the records and want to look at the records of terrorists, if we give up on our liberty, I mean, if we give up on who we are as a people, has the fight been worth it? You know, have we not succumbed in the battle? Are we not defeated from within if we get rid of and give up on the Bill of Rights? And I'd like to finish with one story that builds upon the Sixth Amendment. The Sixth <coughs> Amendment also says you have a right to a speedy trial. About six months ago, a kid by the name of Khalif Browder was a 16-year-old black kid in the Bronx. He was arrested and accused of a crime. He was put in Rikers Island and kept there for three years, two years in solitary confinement without a trial. That shouldn't happen in America. That defies the Sixth Amendment, defies the concept of justice and freedom. He was kept in jail for two years in solitary confinement. He was beaten by gangs, beaten by guards. That shouldn't happen in America. And as I run for president, as I crisscross the country, as I'm gone on long hours, I try to think about that and think about what I believe and what I want our country to be again. And I think about, you know what? I want a country that believes in the entire Bill of Rights. I want to be the candidate that believes in the Sixth Amendment with the same fervor that we believe in the rest of the Bill of Rights. I want to be the party of justice again. I want to be the party of the entire Bill of Rights. And I hope you do too. Thank you very much.